Hey church family, it's Jordan. I'm here with our Monday morning devotional video. Uh, we're going to be going to 2 Samuel 7 and we're going to be looking at the chapter 8 as well. I'm not going to read the whole thing for us today. I'm just going to pick a couple of verses from those two passages. Um, what I want to draw out is something for us today, but it's also sort of uh, helpful for us uh, in our devotional practice to sort of see the continuity between chapters and how that uh, influences how people act and how they respond to God. Um, uh, maybe some of you aren't aware, but uh, chapter and verse sort of segmentation in Scripture is a relatively new addition to what is God's Word. When God conveyed His Word to His people and to His prophets and to, to His apostles and His disciples throughout time, He didn't say, here's verse 11 or here's chapter 6. Um, he, he didn't have that sort of broken out, and, and we've added that in. It's helpful for us in sort of the modern book format. It's helpful in the days of the printing press to be able to point to a particular chapter and verse. That way people can turn there easily regardless of um, who printed it when. Um, and one of the consequences of that happening is that we sometimes lose uh, the, the stream of thought and purpose that happens in God's Word because of chapters being broken up. Um, if you do your devotionals like I have for much of my life, where you read um, a couple of chapters each day, and then you stop at the end of the chapter, and then you pick up the next day where you left off, um, one of the things that happens is you sort of get these arbitrary ends to Scripture, and then you start a new thought the next day. Um, and again, if you sort of, um, one of the things I'm doing recently, which I found really helpful, uh, I've shared with a few people, and they found helpful is I, I read overlaps. So I read two chapters a day in Old Testament, two chapters a day in the New Testament, and then I overlap them with the day prior. So I have one a chapter that is shared from the day prior that is in my current day. Um, and so I have, you know, essentially four chapters I'm doing, but two of them are, are, are always repetitive to the day before. Um, what's really helpful for me in doing that is that I see some of these continuous thoughts, and I, I don't maybe miss some of those continuous thoughts as I'm, I'm reading through Scripture. So I would encourage you to try that out. Um, it's a, a really helpful way of sort of looking at Scripture as a whole and, and not necessarily being distracted by this chapter and verse uh, approach that we have um, in a lot of devotionals today. Um, so let's pray. We're going to jump in 2 Samuel 7, uh, chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and chapter 8. Um, and we'll, um, again, share a couple of verses from each of those just so we, we get sort of a sense of the thought. Uh, Jesus, um, you are the uh, answer to a, a part of this prophecy and this promise that was made to King David. Um, I, and I, I pray that we would respond like David does uh, to the promise of your Father, God in heaven, uh, that he would establish uh, his throne, your throne, forever, uh, and that he would uh, set you apart and, and your reign would uh, result in peace for your children. And so uh, I pray that we would respond in the way that David did to that promise being spoken to him so long ago, uh, and that we would be obedient as we receive that promise as well as sons and daughters of the Most High God adopted through the work of Jesus Christ and, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we just ask these things uh, this morning, and I pray that uh, you would help us to have confidence in the work that you have done um, already for us and you will continue to do in us. Amen. All right, so 2 Samuel 7, um, and then uh, chapter uh, 8 as well. And so 2 Samuel 7, uh, setting the scene, David has sort of realized he's got this beautiful, fancy house. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is in a tent. God does not have a permanent home, even though David does. And so he has in his heart to build a temple, a, a, an earthly home uh, for God to reside in instead of in this tent that he does today. And initially, it seems like God is green lighting this, but God kind of causes him to pause and then says, you know, hey, this isn't for you. Now, he does make a promise to David in uh, 2 Samuel 7, uh, which is amazing. And if you were to receive that promise, and I think actually a part of this promise is for us. Uh, and so you'll, you'll hopefully see this as we read. Um, it, you, if you received it like David did, it would be so encouraging. It'd be so empowering. You would, would feel like, you have great vision and direction for your life and where it's going. And again, I think we should because I think part of this promise is for us as well. So in 2 Samuel 7, the, the Lord makes a covenant to David. And this is the promise that he, he gives to him in verse, uh, starting in verse 9. I'm going to read a portion of that. Uh, he says, I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. You think about 
King David ultimately reigned over a relatively small country, and his name is still known to this day throughout the world, and it's a significant part of world history because uh, of the role of Israel and the role of Christianity. And so in, in some ways, that prophetic word is true. Uh, and I will appoint a place for my people, this is verse 10, uh, Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. So this, again, I think is a part of the promise that is sort of still future-looking. We haven't quite seen this age for Israel. They still endure uh, violence uh, because of who they are and where they reside. They don't have that sort of security uh, that I think is fully promised to them here. Uh, and, and from that time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, again speaking to David here, God will rise, will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So this is kind of true. Again, we see sort of an immediate near-term fulfillment of this prophecy. Solomon does come to reign um, after David, and we see uh, the lineage of David continue for some time, even beyond Solomon. Um, and he says, he shall build a house for my name. Again, this prophetic word about Solomon is coming true. But here's the thing where I think we see that there's another layer at play that is uh, still continued through Solomon, but ultimately it really isn't realized until we see Jesus return at the end of time. And, and he goes on in verse 13 to say this, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Again, so there's a promise here where we see the kingdom of David, the, the, the lineage of David disrupted, overthrown, ruled over by others for, for sequences of time throughout human history. So this, I don't think, is a prophetic word that has come true yet. Again, not, not true, just hasn't been fully realized yet. And I think we'll see this with Jesus' return. And it says, uh, God speaking again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Again, I think he's speaking about Jesus here in a sort of a layer uh, as well as Solomon in, in a layer. And so and there it goes on. He says, when I commit some iniquity, and again, this is not Jesus who commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. Now, this is sort of an interesting parallel because, again, we know Jesus uh, was, was beaten and he was bruised and he was uh, given stripes and lashes for our iniquity. So there is, again, still some of this parallel to Jesus. But it, he goes on to say, my steadfast love will not depart from him um, and then he continues on from there. So that's in chapter 7. Now, David responds to this with great gratitude. And so the second half of this chapter, 2 Samuel 7, is David's prayer of gratitude. And he says, um, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? It sort of continues to express a recognition that he isn't worthy of the honor that he is receiving. Now, and he keeps going on. And he, he basically says, you know, God, fulfill your promise. Do what you have said. And I think that's a powerful prayer for us to pray. Acknowledge who we are in the sight of God and in our own worth. We aren't worthy of receiving his love or his grace or his forgiveness or his generosity or his good gifts, all of the things that he gives to us. Um, and yet he does give us and so give us those things. And so we should be filled with gratitude. And we should then continue and say, God, continue to fulfill your promises to me. Because as his children, we actually do have a great number of promises throughout scripture that are for us. And, and so he continues on in this prayer. Now, the thing I want to focus on in sort of this chapter division that I mentioned earlier, in, in chapter 8, right after this, if, if you stopped reading at 7 and then reset the next day, you'd think they're two different stories. But watch what David does after this prayer happens. It says in chapter 8, After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took um, Methagama out of the hands of the Philistines. And then it goes on, he defeats Moab and he defeats... Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, uh, the king of Zobah. Again, some of these names I can't even pronounce. And all of chapter 8 is about David's victories. And it's interesting to see that David not only hears the word of God and accepts the promise of God, he then goes out and he does something about it. And that, I think, is, is to us a challenge. Um, so often we look at these promises in Scripture and we receive them. And then we sort of recognize that they are true mentally we sort of um, uh, assent to them and then uh, we walk away and we do nothing uh, and my challenge for you this week uh, look at who you are in Christ Jesus you are a new creation who has been promised a new life a new body an eternity in heaven with God 
um, to, to enjoy the, the splendor and the goodness of God forever without fear of harm or tear or sorrow or sickness, how should that change how you approach your life today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? And if you're like David, you receive this word, you recognize the truth of it, you are grateful for it, it should allow us to move freely against God's enemies, to be able to share the good news of the kingdom that is yet to come. So that's my challenge and encouragement for you today. Uh, be like David in this moment. You have the promises of God that his son is going to sit upon the throne forever uh, and that we as his children are going to be called into that enjoyment and the blessing of that kingdom. And so we all have an opportunity to then go and do something if we are really convinced and we are faithful in believing that what God says is going to come true. So that's the devotion for today. Again, uh, sorry for interrupting the Christianese series if you're looking for the next one, uh, but uh, that will be coming next week. So um, uh, everybody have a great week. I love you all. Look forward to being together with you this week for midweek on Thursday night. Bye.